welcome back everyone who's watching it on Moodle. Um, again, like percentage of matches on DNA and protein level. And be aware, something like this will definitely be on the exam. Okay, Commando says 50% protein. And how much DNA? The same. Oh, that's interesting. Actually, same actually. All right, so we have at least one answer. So in this case, if I didn't put any answer, that is so stupid. All right, let me do this uh, on the board then, since I have the board. Um, so we have uh, CAC, CAC, CAT, right? And then we have GCG. And we have GCA, and we have TCC, and the other one is AGT, and then we have GAA. Is that readable? No, that's not readable for you guys. And we have GAG. All right, let me switch to full screen mode then. I hope my overlay is active there as well. All right, so I'll put not the overlay. I will move myself to the middle a little bit. And I think you should be able to read the board now, right? So um, very basically what we want to do is we want to encode both of them to protein level, right? So we say um, CAC, so CAC codes for a histidine. CAT, CA T also codes for a histidine. We have GCG, so we have GCG, which is alanine, and we have GCA, GCA, which also codes for an alanine. Then we have TCC, so we have uh, UCC, which codes for a serine. Then we have AGT, AGT, AGU which codes for a serine as well. And then we have GAA, so GAA codes for GLU. And we have GAG, so we have GAG, which also codes for GLU. So you can see that on the protein level, there is a 100% match, right? So the mismatch is 0%, while if we would look at the DNA level, um, the DNA level would be one mismatch here, it would be one mismatch here, there would be uh, three mismatches here, right? So all these three don't match, and here there's one more mismatch, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six differences. So there is six out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So six out of twelve. So the percentage similarity on DNA level is only 50% while on protein level um, the similarity is actually 100%. Is that clear? Why, why commando do you say S1 is his a la ser pro through a la? Okay, I get it. Good, 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 good. Yeah, so you just go through sequence one, you write down the, the protein sequence and you do the same thing for the second sequence. Um, all right, good, good, good. So, and everyone's happy, everyone's there. Um, so ha the, the, this wheel is a very common wheel um, and it occurs a lot when you translate from DNA to protein. Um, hey, of course, there's things like stop codons in there as well. And you have the methionine here on the bottom, which is actually the, uh, so this one here, which is actually the, uh, the start codon. It's the wheel of DNA fortune. Kind of, kind of, kind of. But it is, there are very, but on the wheel, it's no T. No, because the wheel actually goes on mRNA level. So on mRNA level, the T is a U. Yeah, yeah. So if you say T, 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 then it actually is U, 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 which would code for a phenylalanine. All right, makes sense, good. So this will definitely be on the exam, like at least a couple of them, um, because they're easy questions to make. But on genetic level, T is different from U. 
Um, yeah. In, in, well, on DNA, a U does not occur. A U is just the T base pair in RNA. So in RNA, the, the base pair that codes for T, you call that U. And it, it also matches with the, uh, with the A. And then, of course, you have the modified U as well, which is the, uh, the phi, the, the omega, or the, the, phi, the this sign, right? So the, that one. And that's actually a U, but then with a chemical modification. <coughs> all right, so good. If that's all clear, then we move on to the next one. So I told you guys that when you compare DNA sequences um, and you want to score an alignment, then you have to take into account that some things are very common and some things are very uncommon. So here we see the four different base pairs, right? So we see A, G, T, and C. And we see here that uh, transitions are very frequent. So an A very frequently is kind of mutating into a G. A C is very frequently mutating in a T. And you can see that that is because of the fact that these uh, chemical formulas are very similar, right? And so just chemically speaking, hey, when the DNA is incorporating an A base pair into the genome, it is much more likely for the polymerase or the, the, the for the polymerase to make a mistake and just put a guanine at this position. Right, because they look biochemically, they look very similar. The same thing holds for cytosine and thymine. And these chemically look very, very similar. But it is very uncommon for a C to change to a G without having some kind of a an external influence. And so transitions are usually caused by polymerase taking the wrong base pair and inserting it at that position. Uh, while transversions are relatively rare and transversions are generally occurring when you have real genetic mutations. Um, and like a, a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, generally is a CG SNP or a CA, um, but almost never do you see a CT, a single nucleotide polymorphism, um, because these are just mistakes by the polymerase by putting it in. Um, and so these things, they, they, they have to take into account. So when you are scoring, if something is similar on a DNA level, right, then most algorithms nowadays take the substitution probability as a weighing factor. So instead of just scoring a mismatch as minus one, uh, they score a transition at like minus 0 0.25 and a transversion is scored at minus one. I hope that's clear, and that's it. Based on the on the on the, the chemical formula, you can actually see very easily that have for these two, it's very the the polymerase can just make a mistake because biochemically or chemically they look very similar. So hey, in, in putting an A at a certain position or a G um, doesn't matter too much because they are chemically very similar. The same thing holds for amino acids. So amino acids have the same thing because amino acids, some amino acids are very similar and some amino acids are very, very different, right? So um, here we see the Taylor diagram of the amino acids and we see more or less the distance between them um, based on, so the distance between the P and the G is, is not that big, but the distance between a P and an F is really big, right? Because they, they are more or less on opposite sides. And the same thing holds for a Q going to a V, while a Q going to an E, uh, you want to penalize less. Right, so the, the idea is, is when you are comparing sequences, hey, you have to take into account that some things might be biochemically more or less similar, and if they are biochemically more or less similar, it doesn't, you, you don't want to penalize as hard for them as when they are very, very different. So this leads to these scoring matrices. So here we see the uh, PUM. 250 matrix um, and these are this is the scoring matrix of one of the scoring matrices when you which you can use when you compare two amino acid sequences so when you compare two amino sequ acid sequences with each other you see here these numbers right and these numbers are uh, based on experimental evidence on more or less how often a mutation is seen from one amino acid to the other and of course you want to give a very big positive score if the things are the same and of course the question always comes up, why is a W to a W scored as a 17 and why is a V scored to a valine a 4? And that just has to do with the, the, the 
the way that the algorithm works. Yeah, but you can see that there are positive scores and that there are negative scores. So a score of zero means that this is a very likely mutation, right? So going from a lysine um, to uh, an, an E, which is uh, the glut glutamate or glutamine, um, is very commonly observed. While the more negative the score, the less these things are observed in uh, in, in real protein alignments. And so what what you can learn is, for example, hey, that a cysteine is very unlikely to be changed by a tryptophan, um, but it is uh, relatively likely, for example, to be changed to a serine because they are very, very close to each other. And then if you look here, then you have the serine, which is the S, and then you have the cysteine, uh, which is more or less here, hey, and these two are relatively close together. Yeah, so it's the, the, the point accepted mutation matrix takes into account how similar and how dissimilar certain amino acids are from each other. And when you align two things together, it will take this into account. Um, and the, 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 the positive scores on the, on the x equals y axis, hey, you shouldn't really care about them. But they are just based on the fact that some things are more preserved than other ones. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, um, and, uh, the, the cysteine itself is, is relatively well preserved and that also holds for the tryptophan um, because they are proteins which have, are, they are amino acids which are very special. But don't, don't worry about those. So another type of scoring matrix is actually the Blossom matrix, which is the block substitution matrix. And so um, the amino acids in the table are grouped according to the chemistry of each of the side chains, which is different from the PUM matrix because the PUM matrix is just built uh, based on the point accepted mutation. And so this is based on more or less the uh, the wheel that you see here, right? That had the glycine is actually coded by G G and then doesn't care what the third base pair is. And while here, the glue and the asp, and they, they, they have the same two initial letters, but the third letter is different, right? So um, glue and asp are relatively close to each other in the uh, PUM matrix, but they can have very different biochemical functions. And that is why in the Blossom matrix, there are different scores. And so each value in the matrix is calculated by dividing the frequency of occurrence of the amino acid pair in the blocks database. Um, so the blocks database is one of these databases, which is, cons which is built with homologous sequences. And so here they just look and they look at the data and see how often is a certain amino acid changed in a homologous protein by another um, amino acid. And so a score of zero indicates that the frequency with which a given two amino acids were found aligned in the database was expected by chance. A positive score is that it's found more often than chance. So that means that had two amino acids are very likely to be substituted by each other. And a negative score means that it's very unlikely for an amino acid to be scored by another one. Um, so Blossom matrices comes in, uh, come with a number, right? Blossom R. And that means that you build the matrix from this blocks database with no more than R percent of similarity. And so when you take the Blossom 62 matrix, this is built using sequences with no more than 62 percent similarity. So and that, that's why you um, take it off. And so you have different Blossom matrices and these different Blossom matrices allow you to um, do alignments based on what you expect. So if you use the Blossom 80 matrix, then hey, you're telling the algorithm that I expect these proteins to be related. If you use the Blossom 45 matrix, you're saying that, well, these proteins might be related, but if they are related, they are very distantly related, right? So that's why you only take sequences which are less or which are up to 45% similar. And so the, the number behind the Blossom uh, tells the algorithm more or less what, what your expect expectation is based on the alignment. And, and um, the Blossom 62 is more or less mid-range, is more or less most frequently used. 
There's a fun fact about the Blossom 62 matrix. Um, so the Blossom 62 matrix is the default matrix when you do a protein blast. Um, it has been used for many years as the standard, um, but it is not exactly accurate according to the algorithm which has been described by the, by the people that came up with it. Um, so they, they made a mistake in calculating the original Blossom 62 matrix, but surprisingly the Blossom 62 wrongly calculated matrix or the one that's not calculated based on the original algorithm that was described by Hennikoff and Hennikoff is actually better so it improves search performance so why that is no one knows exactly um, but had the original Blossom 62 so the default matrix is actually not entirely accurate. So some amino acid numbers, so the, the, the frequency at which they were observed to change in the database, um, did not match what was in the database, but still it worked It worked better than the standard algorithms for alignment. So uh, the miscalculated blossom is still the default um, because it improves search performance. And why that is, no one knows exactly. All right, so when we look at PUM matrices and uh, Blossom matrices, um, then the PUM matrix is ma based on global alignments, so global alignments of closely related proteins, while the Blossom matrix is based on local alignments, right? Because you're finding the best optimal substring. So the PUM1 matrix is the matrix calculated from comparison of sequences with mo no more than 1% divergence, while for the Blossom matrix is the other way around, right? So a Blossom 1 matrix means that it's a matrix calculated for comparison sequences with no more than 1% identity. So a, a Blossom 50 matrix is similar to a PUM 50 matrix, but a Blossom 75 matrix is similar to a PUM 25 matrix. Right, because of the fact that they are defined in, in the opposite way. And so the, the Blossom, are, Blossom matrices, all of them are based on observed alignments. They are not extrapolated from comparison of clo closely related proteins. So that they are, while the PUM matrices are extrapolated. So they made the PUM1 matrix and then the PUM2, PUM3, PUM4 matrices, they are all uh, more or less extrapolated. So they, they, don't redo the, uh, they don't redo the calculation, but for the Blossom matrix, the recalculation is done based on this blocks database every time. Um, so the higher number in matrices, uh, in matrices naming scheme, scheme denote a larger evolutionary distance. And so if you are comparing a um, a Bos Taurus with a Bos Indicus, so a cow from Europe with a cow from uh, India, and then you assume that these things are very closely related, so you would use a, uh, a, a PUM, uh, a, a higher number PUM matrix, um, a, a lower number PUM matrix, so you would use probably use PUM1. But if you are comparing a cow with a dolphin, and then the evolutionary distance between them is further apart, and then you would definitely use a PUM matrix with a higher number, like a PUM20. Um, and then for Blossom, the larger, num uh, larger numbers in matrix naming scheme denote higher sequence similarity and therefore smaller evolutionary distance. Right? So if you are comparing two cow species, you would use a Blossom99 and you would use a PUM1. Um, and the yeah, so that's the way that they work. Um, but they are very similar in what they do. Um, why Blossom is exactly the, uh, the default, I don't know, um, because PUM matrices work just as well. But there, it's just because you, because it's not a solved issue, right? Because what is similar and what is different is not something that is easily answered. Um, and especially on protein levels where he, amino acids can be very similar chemically speaking, or they can be very similar encoded using the DNA, and you have just two different ways of looking at similarity. Um, so. All right, so finding the optimal alignment is actually a solved thing. So once you have your, your, um, your sequences, you have your, this is the way that I'm going to score differences. And so for example, I'm going to use the Blossom 62 for comparison of, of, of protein alignments. And then the, the optimal algorithm, the, the best algorithm to perform an alignment is actually the Smith-Waterman algorithm, which was invented in 1981. Um, and it is a systematic construction of all optimal solutions. So you get all the best, 
uh, you get all the best solutions and it is actually mathematically proven that you cannot do a better alignment than using the smith modern algorithm. Uh, the smith modern algorithm works for global and local alignments um, but it takes a time proportional to the product of the sequence length. So if you do L1 minus L2, that is the number of operations that the uh, smith waterman algorithm uses to do the alignment. And this is of course very bad, because if you think about how you would do a local alignment, local alignments nowadays you would go to ensemble and you would do a blast search. But a blast search is not using the smith waterman algorithm, so it will not give you the optimal alignment. But the reason why it doesn't give you the optimal alignment is because the sequences that you are comparing to, because you have your own little piece of DNA sequence for example, and you want to blast it against all known genomes in the database. Right? If you would use the smith waterman algorithm, this would involve like billions and billions and billions of computer operations, multiplied with the length of your input sequence. Hey, if you think about like the, the, the human genome, hey, the human genome is like 3 billion letters. If you then would take an input sequence which is 10 letters long, then you would have to do 30 billion um, steps in the algorithm. Well, if your input sequence would be 100 base pairs long, then you would do 100 uh, times uh, 2 to 3 billion base pairs. So it is, it is the optimal algorithm but it is computationally very very intensive because of this fact that the time taken is proportional to the length of the product sequences so l1 times l2 so the idea is very easily explained because what they do is they create a dot plot and then they find the minimal path to this dot plot so a dot plot is something which looks like this um, yeah, so here we have for example two sequences we have one sequence for human we have one sequence for mouse on the x-axis and yeah, so you see that they start uh, on zero so in humans we have around 90 90,000 base pairs on the top. Here in mouse we also have like uh, 90,000 base pairs of mouse sequence and then the idea is is that every time you just and so the white areas are mismatches and the black areas are matches and what you are trying to find is you find you try to find the minimal path and so you want to hit so you want to walk from the 0, 0 to the 90,000, uh, 90,000 90, point and you want to walk in such a way uh, that you hit as many of these black dots as possible and the minimal number of white dots. And so in this case you would, you would look at this plot and you would say well you would walk this path right so up until here the sequences are similar and then the the the, the, the mouse sequence and the human so the mouse sequence here which is 90,000 base pairs is more or less the same sequence which is encoded in the human sequence at around 75,000 base pairs and so the last like 15,000 base pairs of the human sequence have no real homology to the last 15,000 base pairs here in the mouse sequence so that is what a dot plot is. So how do you find a path through the dot plot? Well, hey, here we have the word uh, piranhas and the word parana. What a stupid word. Um, but the first thing that we do is we mark all perfect slash high scoring matches of sequence S1 and S2. Right, so the P matches the P, the A matches the A, and the other A matches the A. Of course, when you're doing this for proteins or for DNA, you would score them based on transversions, right? So here we are creating a matrix just filled with zeros and ones, right? Because we're looking at normal letters, um, and there, there's no biological background. Hey, but if you would use a Blossom matrix, then you would say, well, a P to a P is a score of, of uh, 15, a P to a I is a score of minus 2, a P to a R is a score of minus 6, right? So you would just use the entries of the Blossom matrix. And now, of course, hey, what we now do is then, hey, we, we follow the algorithm, the smith waterman algorithm, to walk through this dot plot, and so we start all the way here at the beginning, and hey, if there, hey, so any pairwise alignment can be represented as a path in the matrix, so the optimal pairwise alignment is just, hey, if there is a line going through your, your box, and then you follow that line. And when there is no choice, um, then, you, then you, you pick where you want to go. And so you, you, you can go this way, you can go that way, or you can go that way, right? So this way would, incre would include introducing a gap into the paranas, this way would introduce introducing a gap into the, the piranhas, and going like this would be a mismatch.
Is that clear that you can hey, that this is a deletion or hey here you insert an, a, a, a gap so the, the horizontal steps introduce gaps and the diagonal steps they introduce mismatches between the two sequences all right so I told you guys that that the Smith Waterman algorithm is um, very good finds the optimal alignment but computationally really really expensive and you don't want to do that so nowadays we always use or almost always use the blast tool which is called basic local alignment search tool and so the blast tool only works for local alignment so when you have for example a genome sequence and you have a small sequence that you want to find in the genome sequence um, it was invented by Allschutz et al, 1990, published, um, and it is the most popular bioinformatics program which is in the world, right? Because alignments are more or less the key to bioinformatics, um, and BLAST is nowadays the most used tools. Um, and it speeds up searches by an order of magnitude, so you can compare uh, one sequence against all of the sequencing in GenBank, and it only will take you a couple of minutes. If you would use the Smith-Waterman algorithm, it would take you almost a hundred years for a single BLAST search to complete. Um, and the reason why that is, is that it uses a very smart pre-processing step. So the whole algorithm is based on something which is called camerization and only sequences with similar structures are being um, being compared. Um, so do I have a slide about camerization? No. So camerization is a very interesting technique. Let's go back to the board. Why not? thing is there anyway and I don't have that many slides for today. So camerization is when you have So when you have a sequence, right? So let's say A, T, T, A, A, T, T, A, A, C, C, G, A, A, T. Right, so now when you want to camerize this sequence, what you're saying is I'm going to create camers of, for example, length four. So I'm just going to say K equals four. So what I'm going to do is now say that, well, I have this sequence. So this is then a sequence in my database and I take the first four base pairs. So this is A, T, T, A, right? So what I now do is I just write down the camer. So this is A, T, T, A, and I write down where this camer starts. So this camer starts at position one, right? Then I do the next camer and the next camer is T, T, A, A, starting at position two. The next one is T, A, A, uh, no, write it down properly, T, A, A, T, right? And this starts at position three. The next one is a A A T so A A T T starting at position four and now here we find the first overlapping camer because this is A T T A right and we already had A T T A so we write down this A T T A also starts at position five right so instead of storing the whole sequence what I'm doing is I'm just breaking down the sequence into very small sequences and then looking to see where the start positions are. So now when I want to search for a certain sequence, right? So now imagine that I have, um, and of course this you do with the whole sequence, so you get all possible blocks. Yeah, but now when I'm looking for a sequence, which is for example, um, like this, um, right? So now I camerize this sequence as well. So I have C, A, T, T, then I have A, T, T, A, and I have T, T, A, G. Now what it does, it just searches for these camers in the database. And it searches for this one in the database. And it searches for this one in the database. And now the best alignment is the one which has the most camer matches to the database and then also with the positions included, right? So instead of having to compare a lot of different sequences and making, and making a lot of comparisons, introducing gaps and these kinds of things, I now know just by looking at this sequence that the only position in the camer original sequence where it could bind is actually at position five. 
right? Because at position five, there is an exact match between these four base pairs and these four base pairs, which means that this is a position that I should look and do the alignment for, right? So I should try C A A uh, C A T T A G. I should try and align it at not position five because hey, this this is just the second camer that I'm looking at. So here I now know that I should look from position four to position one, two, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So from four to nine. So I have to do an alignment from four to nine, and I don't have to do the alignment from one to. Uh, uh, from 1 to 5, from 2 to 6. So it, it skips out a whole bunch of possibilities. And this camerization is a very nice trick when you're working with very long sequences, very long pieces of text, and when you want to kind of do that. And so that's the, that's the basic behind BLAST, is that instead of having to test all possible alignments, if you are not testing all possible alignments, you're first trying to figure out where you should try the alignments, and that is based on exact Kamer matches. And of course the, the, the whole database, that the whole Genbank database is Kamerized for different Kamer sizes, and so when you, when you input like a very long DNA sequence, it will take a large Kamer. Um, and when you input a very short DNA sequence, like 20 base pairs, then it will use a very short Kamer. And of course, a short Kamer will yield more matches, so you have to do more real alignments at these positions, but a long Kamer will kind of quickly exclude like large parts of the genome, so you never have to do the alignment there. And this is the smart a pre-processing step which is done in BLAST. So that is why BLAST is so popular and why it is so quick. Because in the first step, after camerizing your input sequence, hey, it just looks through the database to see is there any camer that matches to somewhere in the database and if yes, then I'm only going to do the alignments in those positions. And I'm not going to do it at any of the positions where there's no camer match. And that is the, that is the kind of winning trick um, which made uh, Alshut uh, one of the most, well, cited bioinformaticians in history. Is that clear? Camerization? Clear. Good. All right, let me continue. So when you look at BLAST, the BLAST tool is very smart, right? So you have different versions of BLAST. So you have DNA against DNA, then you use BLAST-N for BLAST nucleotide. You can BLAST proteins against proteins, which is called BLAST-P. Then you have DNA six frames against proteins, so this means that my input is a DNA sequence, but I can search against a protein database. This is called BLAST-X for translation or something X. Uh, I don't know exactly why it is X. That, um, and then you can, you can have an input sequence, which is a protein sequence, you can search against a DNA uh, database and of course six frames here are, are six codons in a row um, and this is called TBLASTN so this is the translational BLAST nucleotide um, so translational BLAST nucleotide then you have the DNA six frames against DNA via six frame translation which is called TBLASTX so this is more or less very similar to DNA versus DNA but this takes into account the fact that DNA comes in um, um, uh, codons. And then you have Megablast, and Megablast nowadays um, does many, many different queries, And but it's more like a, a smart algorithm that based on the input figures out which kind of underlying Blast algorithm it wants to use. But hey, these are the options. So hey, remember that if you want to search a DNA versus DNA, you use Blast N, um, unless you want to do like a protein translation in the middle, hey, because you're saying I'm not interested in DNA sequence, which are very similar. I'm interested in DNA sequences which code for a similar protein because then you are doing TBLASTX. All right, so um, in when you do BLAST and you have alignments, they, they get an, a quality number. So instead of getting a percentage of matches or a gap opening and all of these things, no. What they do is very basically they just give you a single quality number. So uh, the, the, the quality number is called an E value in BLAST and, and the smaller this uh, number is the, 
the closer to zero is 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 the best. So it works kind of like a p-value, right? So a p-value of one is not very significant, or it's actually not significant. But the the smaller the p-value, or the closer to one, it, or the closer to zero it gets, the more significant your p-value, the more likely that this is not due to chance. And so um, and the e-value is kind of a representation of how many alignments of that quality or better are in a random database are expected to be in a random database. And so it's kind of a p-value um, with a permutation approach, but here they, in Blast they call it an e-value. And so if you have an e-value of 1 times 10, 6, and that means that there's a chance of 1 in a million that you would find an alignment with a similar or better quality in a random database. And of course, depending on how many sequences are in the database, this could mean that this is very significant or very not significant. Um, besides the e-value, you always want to look at the percentage of identity. The percentage of identity tells you how many um, exact matches there are, right? So it ranges from 0% to 100%. And then you have the length of the alignment because it is a local sub, uh, because it's a local alignment. Of course, it can actually chop off the edges uh, of, of the search string that you are looking for. So it might be that the search string, hey, only the first 50 base pairs of the search string are found with 100% identity, but then the next 20 base pairs are not found at all. So, hey, but that, that's the thing that you have to look at. Yeah, so the percentage of identity, the higher the better, and the length of the alignment, the longer the better, uh, the longer the, uh, the, the alignment is. So when you are dealing with homology and you're using BLAS to figure out if two sequences are homologous, then we generally say that two sequences are deemed to be homologous when the e-value is less than 1 times 10 minus 5. There is a continuous stretch of 100 base pairs which is um, which is matched, right? So the uh, the length of the alignment is 100 base pairs. Um, a rule of thumb is 40 amino acids should match, um, and the identity on DNA level needs to be 70 percent, and the DNA on protein or the the, the identity on on protein level is generally considered 25 percent. So if if 25 percent matches of these 40 amino acids or 70% of these 100 base pairs match, and then you generally assume that two sequences are homologous. Man chicken. All right, thank you for that insightful comment. All right, so that was single sequence alignment, so or pairwise sequence alignment. So when we have two sequences, how do we do that? But of course, nowadays, we're not dealing with databases with very, very small with with a single sequence looking for what is the most conser or what is the most standard se or but the most homologous sequence to with yeah, but um, had multiple sequence alignments is one of the most essential tools in molecular biology because we want to find highly conserved subregions or embedded patterns on a set of biological sequences right and so conserved regions are usually a key functional region and so for example if you think about uh, something, all right, so that is going to be a ban. Uh, where's my moderator? Um, I'm going to give a timeout first before we give a ban. At, uh... All right, thank you for the deletion. Very good. And I hit the hammer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very nice. All right, so I had the... the had if you think about the coronavirus, which everyone's thinking about nowadays, then of course, hey, if we want to develop drugs for the coronavirus, hey, if we look at all of these different new mutants that are occurring, hey, then the regions which are not mutating in the coronavirus, those are the regions which are important, right? Because mutations there either make the virus completely not active or it would change the target of the virus. So hey, the regions that stay the same during evolution are usually the regions which are, are um, of interest and or uh, are the regions which are for example the active site of a molecule right so if you think about a big protein and like hundreds or 200 amino acids and then there is part of this protein which does the chemical transformation of substance A to substance B when it's an enzyme right and this part of the protein can of course not change because as soon as it changes the protein is not able to do its core function anymore and if you can't do your core function anymore especially if you're an essential protein or an essential enzyme and then of course something goes wrong and 
it leads to lethality early on in life or or even even earlier yep. so and one of the other tool uh, one of the other reasons why we want to use multiple sequence alignment and get instead of pairwise sequence alignment is that we want to estimate the evolutionary distance between sequences right hey imagine that i have the myostatin gene and i have the myostatin gene for six seven hundred different animals um, then hey using multiple sequence alignment i can figure out how these things are related to each other and how closely or how, how distantly uh, things are related one of the other things where we use multiple sequence alignment for a lot is to predict protein secondary and tertiary structure we already talked about that eh, if you if you have a protein which has for example an alpha helix um, then of course if you know that this is an alpha helix in this protein if you find a region in another protein which is highly homologous then of course you can more or less assume that this will also fold into an alpha helix um, and so it was um, it, it is it is one of these things which is very very difficult for computers so computers can only do multiple sequence alignment since 1987 before that people used to do it by hand so if you go to google and you you google things like uh, protein alignment uh, by hand and then you will then you will find these images where you see scientists having like like pieces of paper which have single letters on them hey, which are then kind of stapled together which they put on the floor hey, and then they they have things and they, they put it underneath it it's it's really 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 funny to see how people used to do this but it used to be just little pieces of papers with pieces of string hey, taped together hey, and then you would move like one hey so you would just sit there you would move it and then you would say okay so these match better um, especially on a protein level hey, and then you would move it and then all of the other would move with it so you would physically do uh, the alignment more or less on 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 the ground and especially for longer proteins this takes hours and, and days even to kind of figure out what the best alignment is um, and before 1987 uh, 1987 you would do it by hand nowadays we can actually uh, do it and that is because of a technique called dynamic programming um, but before that dynamic programming was very very expensive for computers to do but I'm not wanting to go into a lot of detail what dynamic programming actually is um, but and just remember that multiple sequence alignment only possible since the 1990s and so the idea behind multiple sequence alignment is this that you have to perform successive pairwise alignment so you take sequence one pairwise aligned to sequence two pairwise aligned to sequence three pairwise aligned to sequence four take sequence two pairwise aligned to sequence three pairwise aligned to sequence four take sequence three pairwise aligned to sequence four right so you do all possible alignments and then from this you want to build a consensus sequence and then you use this consensus sequence to align the next the the, the other sequences that you have right so there are some crucial parameters when you're dealing with multiple sequence alignments things like which scoring matrix am i using they have a massive influence hey, if you go from using a blossom 62 matrix to using a blossom 80 matrix your pair or your multiple sequence alignments will be completely different because the pairwise alignments will be scored differently um, one of the other two parameters which have a massive influence on multiple sequence alignment is your opening penalty so how much do i penalize opening a new gap and how much do I penalize extending a gap and so these three parameters um, they can completely change the outcome of, of, of a multiple sequence alignment so hey, in the end um, it's more or less the same so if you if you're aligning more than two sequences you can follow the same strategy as aligning uh, two sequences but instead of having a dot plot right you now have a, a dot matrix when you're aligning three when you're aligning four you have a four-dimensional matrix when you're aligning five you have a five-dimensional matrix right and so you use an n-dimensional matrix which each axis representing a sequence to align and so if you have three sequences you get a cube if you have four sequences then you get like a hypercube like a four-dimensional cube and the same thing holds here if you use the smith waterman algorithm you use the same thing you go from the source which is zero 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 in all of the sequences to the sink which is um, n n n at the length of the sequence in all of them
And so the idea is to find the minimal path going from the source through the matrix in such a way that you end up at the sink and you want to hit as many positive points as possible and as little negative points as possible. So if you think about this, because the original Smith-Waterman algorithm in two dimensions was already the length of sequence one multiplied by the length of sequence two. If you think about doing it in three dimensions, then of course it is n to the power of three, right? So if, if all sequences have a similar length, then of course the computational time is O to the power n to the three. And so if you have k sequences, you build a k-dimensional matrix, then you have a runtime of two to the power of k minus one times n to the power of k, which is just insane. These these are exponential algorithms, and hey, this is this is completely unworkable to do a Smith-Waterman algorithm um, on more than three sequences in a reasonable amount of time. Hey, just thinking about doing a multiple alignment of like a hundred or a hundred amino acids in three different proteins is going to take like months of runtime on a computer just using the basic Smith-Waterman algorithm. And so dynamic programming approaches for alignment between two sequences is easily extended to k sequence, but it's impractical due to exponential runtime. So hey, you don't want to do um, exponential runtime. Of course, we can do multiple sequence alignment nowadays. And so and it is very useful for more distant alignments because it, it, it simultaneously shows you which positions of the different proteins are conserved. And in 1988, there was a progressive algorithm which was be designed, and which is called Cluster W. And Cluster W still exists today, is still very much used today. Um, nowadays, it's rebranded and called Cluster Omega. Um, but I always talk about Cluster W because it's essentially the same algorithm. And so what it does, it first identifies the best high scoring pairs. And then it identifies the closest pair of pairs and so on till all sequences are built in. And I will have an example for that. And so it's a multiple alignment scheme where corresponding amino acids are shown in one column. Uh, and I have an example of that as well. And so more or less, how does this start? So hey, if you look here, then you have the alignment of myostatin for 10 different species. So humans and pigs and mouse and rat and sheep. And so here you then see the multiple sequence alignment, right? You see that in many species, there's a gap, but here this uh, brer species actually has this YG insertion, which none of the other species have. Um, Cluster W can be found at this link. Um, nowadays, it will link to Cluster Omega, I think. So how do you read? Uh, so how do you do this? So what is multiple sequence alignment? Well, imagine that we have k sequences. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here k is eight, right? So in theory, if you would do the box, then you would create a, a, a eight-dimensional cube. Um, but since we don't want to create an eight-dimensional cube, we we want to do um, the the kind of cluster W algorithm. So and the, the multiple sequence alignment of these look like this. And um, hey, what we now see is that we have things that are called conserved residues because all sequences have a C or a W at these two positions. Uh, we also see that there's a conserved region here, which is conserved in half of the species. Uh, and what we, more, um, uh, what we also see is that there are more or less patterns that we can observe based on how similar amino acids are. And so here uh, we see valine, loy, uh, 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 alanine, valines again. And so these are all amino acids which are hydrophobic. And the same thing is seen at position three, where we see uh, uh, isoleucine, leucine, valine, and leucine again. And so these are all hydrophobic residues. So that this might mean that and there is a, a region here which does something in like the first four species. And there is a residue here which are conserved, which are very important for the functioning of the protein. And then of course we have these two hydrophobic residues on the, on the beginning of these sequences, which might be due to the fact that this is the part which is um, exposed to the water and not to the cell membrane. And so in the end, hey, you get like an overview of what is conserved and what is different and where are the different regions. All right, that is going to be a ban. Good. All right. Um, how long have I been talking? 48 minutes. Um, yeah, so the, 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 it starts here.
So the uh, cluster W is one of the most popular multiple alignment tools today, or today is actually um, um, cluster omega for doing everything. But the W here stands for weighted. And so different parts of the alignment are weighted differently. It's a three-step process where you first construct pairwise alignments between all sequences. Then you build a guide tree using a neighbor joining method. And then you have a progressive algorithm for for guiding uh, progressive alignments guided by the tree. And the sequences are aligned progressively according to the branching in order of the guide tree. Um, so I think after the break we will go through one of these examples. I made a very small example I think with a very yeah so very uh, very short sequences so sequences which are length length four. Um, so that's good. Alright so then I will stop here so I will stop the recording.